Happy Halloween and I hope you're having a great day. In this video we're going to be taking a deep dive from a betting point of view into three of the most interesting fights taking place this weekend at UFC Fight Night, Albazi versus Moreno. Now we won't be breaking down the Moreno versus Albazi fight in this video, we're going to be focusing more on Blanchfield versus Nami Yunus, but come back to my channel on Thursday where I'll be dropping a breakdown video for more fights, including the main event between Albazi and Moreno. So if you want to watch that, don't forget to subscribe. And on top of that, if you want me to do another bonus breakdown video on Friday, where I break down two of the most popular fights from the pre prelims this week, hit the like button below. Whichever fights get the most comments, the most requests in the comments below, will be the two fights that I break down in the bonus video on Friday, if this video gets 100 likes. And fortunately, I won't be able to do a breakdown video tomorrow, because we're picking up this little guy, who is going to be our new dog. We've already got a dog, her name is Kiko, she is a 10 month old Shiba Inu, and I never thought that I would have two dogs, it's not something that, you know, ever really appealed to me, I thought it would be a lot of work, but she's kind of the first dog that I've ever had where I thought, you know what, she's so friendly, she's so loving, she loves other dogs so much that it's just going to make her, so, her life so much better if she has another dog to play with and keep her company all the time. I play with her a lot, but... Obviously, if she has another dog around, she's never going to be by herself. So here she is getting some Halloween treats today. She is amazing. And we scroll through, you probably find some pictures of me. There's my mum. With Kiko. There's me. Got any more? Got the cringy Instagram picture. She's a lot better looking than I am. So yeah, we're picking up a brother for her tomorrow. He still doesn't have a name. But because I have to travel quite far to go and collect him... It's like a four hour drive to where he is and then a four hour drive back. Won't be able to drop a breakdown video tomorrow. So again, if you've got any ideas for names, please hit the, uh, please let me know in the comments below. I want to call him Rampage. The missus isn't having it. So we're still in negotiations. Also, we talked in last week's video about how we are starting to grind out profits again. Pretty much every single UFC event in live betting. We know over the long term, we make a profit on 70% of UFC events, but due to some technical problems with stream latency, we dipped a little bit here in the last year, but as you can see, we've turned it around and we're starting to grind our profits back up. And so if you look at any time in the past, over the last eight years where we've had a dip, we always bounce back with huge winning runs. We did it here, we did it here, we did it here, we did it here, we did it here. And you already know we're going to do it here as well. And we've already started the process where we're back to making a profit most weeks now. So if live betting interests you, it's my speciality. We make a profit most weeks. Come check it out in my community. I think you'll like it a lot. If you don't, you can just get a refund. It's no problem. Uh, but I think you'll like it a lot. And if you watch every UFC event anyway, you're basically earning money while you watch the UFC. So... You know, over the long term, we perform real good. And we've performing, been performing well lately. And I think you'll like it. Give it a try. So, without further ado, we'll leave him up. Might go back to him later. Just remind you guys, give me some help for names. Because I'm finding it really difficult to name this guy. He's obviously same same as uh, Kiko. He's just a black and tan Shiba Inu. She's red. He's going to be the black and tan one. There she is looking very majestic. So yeah, man. Help us out with a name. Never thought I'd have two dogs, but here we are. Picking him up tomorrow. So let's break down the first fight that I want to talk about on this week's card. Which is going to be Brenson Ribeiro versus Kyle Mercado. So this is an interesting one because I remember when I researched Brenson Ribeiro for his UFC debut kind of stuck in my mind that he was a very very low level fighter and so I couldn't remember much about his debut with Gajuzulov I probably should never <coughs> set myself up to have to pronounce that name so I probably butchered it but I couldn't remember too much about him I just remember researching him for his you know his debut and thinking this guy is very very low level uh, but this is why fight research is so important because it forces you to go back, watch fights like this and refresh your memory on a fighter's strengths and weaknesses. 
And so when I first saw this fight was announced, I remember that, uh, you know, Mercado was quite tough, reasonably well-rounded. I remember Ribeiro being super, super low level. And I thought, you know what? Mercado could be a good bet here. His odds are kind of playable. Uh, but I did change my mind on this one after I researched the fight uh, to the extent where I actually lean towards Ribeiro now. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds, I'll get into the reasons why. So Mercado is the favourite to average odds of about 1.61, which is going to be minus 164 for an implied probability of 62%. If we take a look at the odds on Ribeiro, he's around an average of 2.35 which is going to be plus 135 for an implied probability of 43%. So Ribeiro is 28 years old, 6 foot 3 with an 81 inch reach. And Mercado is 30 years old, 6 foot 4 with a 78 inch reach. So we can see both guys about the same age. And a little bit of a reach advantage for Ribeiro, nothing major. It's probably not going to mean a whole lot in the context of this fight because it doesn't really know how to use his reach. <coughs> but, you know doesn't hurt to have a small reach over your opponent so in terms of how these two match up from a stylistic point of view it is quite a low level fight both guys pretty low level fighters pretty bad fight iq um the reason why i lean towards ribeiro in this fight is for me he's just a much more well-rounded fighter than mercado he doesn't have the best fight iq and you know De you know, because of that, he definitely makes a lot of mistakes in fights. But for me, he's just a much more well-rounded fighter, and he's got much better cardio. Mercado is one of these tough, gritty, determined dudes, but he's quite one-dimensional. He kind of just plods forward, takes control of the center of the octagon, tries to you know put a lot of pressure on his opponents on the feet, and box them up, but doesn't do a whole lot else. Isn't particularly dangerous on the feet, and his high pressure style of fighting is somewhat limited by the fact that his cardio is bad so he slows down a lot as fights wear on for me Ribeiro's got better cardio he moves better he's faster he's more explosive um he does give up cheap takedowns he pulls guard does crazy shit like that but when Mercado <clears throat> he's just one of these guys that because he slows down so much as fights wear on He's the kind of guy that will often get outworked in a low-level matchup. So for me, my lean's definitely Ribeiro on this one. And if I were going to bet this fight, I would take the underdog Ribeiro. I don't like to bet on fights which feature you know, very low-level fighters. So this one is a pass for me. Because neither of these guys are the kind of fighter you can trust. But Ribeiro's tempting. He's the underdog. And like I say, better cardio. More well-rounded. Uh, faster, more explosive, moves better. There's a lot to like here. Um, in terms of how they match up when it comes to striking, like I say, Ribeiro's more technical and he moves better. Mercado's got like a plodding, flat-footed, boxing-heavy style of fighting. In terms of grappling, Ribeiro does give up pretty cheap takedowns. He's quite weak off his back, but then, you know, when Mercado grapples a bit, he, he tires out very, very quickly, so... He needs to be careful when he grapples because he can't afford to grapple too much or he's just going to burn himself out. And Ribeiro can make him work pretty hard on, on the ground. And if Ribeiro gets in top position, <coughs> that'll obviously accelerate the rate at which Picardo slows. So if we take a look at the over-under on this one, I do think it's quite likely this fight goes deep just because neither guy is particularly dangerous. I am very tempted by the over one and a half rounds at odds of 1.66. Um reason being if you look at the records of both guys they do have tons of first round finishes you look at Mercado's record it's the same story but I think this is one of those classic examples of where when fighters are you know competing on the regional circuit against a really low level of opponent as you can see by the records of the guys that Mercado has been facing because they're at such a low level they're able to get finishes but then these low level guys themselves in terms of low level for UFC level like Mercado and Ribeiro what you see is on the regional circuit they get tons of finishes and then when they face a step up in competition all of a sudden you know then all of a sudden they're not as dangerous and styles make fights so they start going to a decision a lot more often 
It is worth noting that Mikado is dropping down the light heavyweight for this fight, so perhaps his cardio will be better. But he is like one of these slow, sluggish, flat-footed sort of heavyweights, so I don't think we're going to see him look massively better. <coughs> <coughs> a heavyweight, excuse me guys, got a bit of a cough. So yeah, I do like the over one and a half rounds there. Pretty good chance I will bet that. In terms of the props on this one, um, what is Ribeiro by decision? So Ribeiro by decision, 6.0 plus 510. I quite like that. I think Ribeiro by decision wins a reasonably good amount of time. It's not a bad prop. I won't be betting it myself. I don't bet props, but, you know, Ribeiro by decision, not bad, not bad. So I hope you found that breakdown useful. Now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Janata Denise versus Derek Lewis. Now, I was very disappointed when I saw the odds for this fight because obviously Derek Lewis is a big name in the UFC. He's fought for a title. He's been in the top 10 of the UFC's heavyweight division for as long as I can remember. And Janata Denise is this, you know, up and coming fighter who's pretty unproven. Hasn't beaten anyone of note, doesn't have any wins over any big names. You know, and in his third fight in the UFC, he's suddenly taken on a big name in Derek Lewis. And I thought this would be an opportunity to be able to get really good odds on Denise because I'm extremely high on Janata Denise. I think he's a brilliant heavyweight. I think he's got a very bright future in the heavyweight division. And I thought this could be one of those examples where, you know, wiki capping and name value and the fact that Denise hasn't fought anyone would give us good odds on Denise and perhaps we'd even be able to bet Denise at nice underdog odds against an older declining veteran in Lewis. So I was kind of shocked, kind of surprised and very disappointed when I saw that Denise is quite a big favourite in this fight. It's not what I expected. I thought on name value alone Lewis would have been a decent sized favourite here. You know, I, maybe I'm, I'm completely off but I thought we might even have been able to get Denise as, as, as high as like 3.0 you know, plus 200, something like that. So very disappointing that he's this big of a favourite, but I do think this is a great stylistic matchup for Denise. I think this is old school versus new school, and I think Lewis is in a lot of trouble. So if we start off by taking a look at the odds, we can see that Denise is the favourite at average odds of about 1.57, which is going to be minus 175 for an implied probability of 64%. If we take a look at the odds on Lewis, he's around an average of 2.45 which is going to be plus 145 for an implied probability of 41%. So Lewis is 39 years old, 6 foot 3 with a 79 inch reach. Denise is 33 years old, 6 foot 4 with a 79 and a half inch reach. So we can see both guys pretty much the same size, but we can see there is quite a significant age gap for the stage in their careers that they're in. So Lewis 39, Denise 33. That makes Denise six years younger, and we know that the younger fighter wins around 67% of the time when there's a six-year age gap in a fight. And when you've got like an age gap of six years, it's not always a big deal. It really depends on who the fighters are, what stage in their careers they're at. But the thing about Derek Lewis is he has been on a very steep decline the last few years to the point where you know he's getting injured all the time. He's not as durable as he used to be. He's not as explosive and dangerous as he used to be. So, Lewis definitely in the tail end of his career. Father time is starting to catch up on him. Whereas Denise is improving from fight to fight. A lot healthier, a lot fresher in his career. Faster, more explosive, more athletic. And a uh, difficult stylistic matchup for him. You know, if we take a look at Lewis's record. You know, he has been picking up a couple wins. But no doubt he's on a decline and it doesn't take much to hurt Lewis in there these days and, you know, causing big problems. Now, of course, with, with the guy as tough as Lewis, as dangerous as Lewis, you can never count him out. If he lands one clean shot on anyone in the division, it's over, right? Power's the last thing to go. But from a technical point of view, I think this is a very good fight for Denise. So... If we think about how these two match up when it comes to grappling, it's unlikely this fight will go to the ground. Denise is a pure kickboxer from a traditional kickboxing background. We can see him in the glory gloves. So he never tries to take his opponents down. Derek Lewis never tries to take his opponents down either. Obviously, Lewis is very weak off his back. Um, <clears throat> but he showed in his last fight that his takedown offense isn't bad. And Lewis doesn't really have the offensive wrestling 
to get the fight to the ground. Lewis never tries to take his opponents down. If he did, if he got on top of Denise, Denise would be in a lot of trouble. But I think it's very unlikely that, you know, that happens. So if the fight stays standing, obviously Lewis is dangerous. We've already said one shot can end the fight in an instant. Lewis is one of the hardest hitters in the history of the heavyweight division. But Denise is very technical, moves well, faster, more explosive, better defensively. And he's just a better striker out of the two at this stage in their careers. So Lewis is going to be trying to stay in a defensive shell, not get into any exchanges. He's going to hope to deter Denise from coming forward and attacking him with his power. And Denise is going to be walking him down, chipping away at him with his diverse range of attacks. His higher volume style of striking is more technical striking and racking up volume on Lewis. And this is one of those fights where I don't see Lewis being able to outgrapple Denise. I don't see Lewis being able to outstrike Denise in terms of volume. The only way that Lewis is going to be able to win this fight is by big knockout. And while that could happen, because Denise is a skilled kickboxer, it won't be easy. Especially because at this stage in his career, Lewis is a lot more fragile and injury prone than he used to be. And we know Denise is very dangerous and very healthy. So heavily lean towards Denise here. You can't bet Denise is a big favourite against such a dangerous, heavy-handed power puncher like Lewis. Um, you know, I think if you bet on favourites in the heavyweight division over the long term, you'd really struggle to make a profit. But, <clears throat> you know, this one of those fights where I'd be surprised if Denise were to lose. I think he most likely just outclasses Lewis with technique. Avoids getting knocked out and uh, gets his hand raised at the end of the night. So in terms of the over-under, um, it's difficult to say, right? Because this is one of those fights where both guys are very dangerous. So you could see them show each other a lot of respect and not engage too much. And kind of point fight a little bit. Which would see the fight probably creep over that 7.5 minute mark for the over 1.5 rounds to hit. Sometimes when you get guys who are very, very dangerous... They show each other a lot of respect and a fight goes deeper than people anticipate. We saw this actually happen in the Derek Lewis, Francis and Garnu fight, right? I think the odds on the fight to go to a decision was something insane, like minus a thousand or something. But both guys showed each other so much respect because they knew how dangerous one another was. You know, both guys barely landed a punch in the entire fight and it easily went to a decision. So you could see that happening in a fight like this, but obviously... Denise is up and coming, looking to make a name for himself. He is aggressive. He does look to draw his opponents in the big exchanges. So with how dangerous both these guys are, how fragile Lewis is at this stage in his career, I do lean more towards the under one and a half rounds. But with the way the odds are, the over might give you the better risk to reward ratio. Very unlikely it goes to a decision, I will say that. But the over one and a half rounds is interesting to me at dog odds. Um, I won't be betting it though because obviously both guys are really dangerous, you know, close to even money. You'd be crazy to bet something like that on a fight as volatile as this that could end in an instant. So in terms of um, prop bets for this fight, Denise by knockout at TKO is the most likely outcome. But in percentage terms, the odds aren't that much better than just betting in money line. So if you really want to bet this fight, I would just take Denise money line. Um, doesn't make sense to go for something highly specific like Denise by Narco or TKO. Just take the money line and I would say do that. Don't get greedy. So I hope you found that useful. All right, now let's break down the next fight on this card, which is going to be Erin Blanchfield versus Rose Namajunas. So if we start by taking a look at the odds on this one, we can see that Blanchfield is the favorite at average odds of about 1.70. Just refresh, make sure we got the latest odds. Yeah, Blanchfield's a favourite at odds of about 1.71, which is going to be minus 141 for an implied probability of 58%. If we take a look at the odds on Nami Yunus, she's around an average of, say, 2.15, which is going to be plus 115 for an implied probability of 47%. So Blanchfield is 25 years old, 5 foot 4 with a 68 inch reach. Nami Yunus, 32 years old, 5 foot 5 with a 65 inch reach. So pretty big age gap in this fight, but in the context of this matchup, I don't think it means anything other than the fact that Blanchfield should be making big improvements from fight to fight. And to be fair though, 
Nami Yunus appears to be improving in this new division as well. She's looking better than ever, in my opinion, in the flyweight division. So, you know, she's only 32 years old, hasn't taken tons of damage in her career. It's not like she's declining or anything like that. I think she's just trying to reinvent herself in the flyweight division and, and put another title under her belt in a brand new division. But you would expect Blanchfield to be improving. So, in the context of this fight, it's a classic striker versus grappler matchup where I think we can all agree if this fight stays standing, Blanchfield's performances against Jessica Andrade and Manon Fioro tell us that it's going to be a pretty difficult night for Blanchfield if she can't get the fight to the ground. We know Nami Yunus moves very well. She's a very technical striker, true legit knockout power. She, she's just dangerous on the feet and the skill gap between these two on the feet is enormous. But obviously, if Blanchfield can get Nami Yunus to the ground, get into top position, she can take those striking advantages away from Nami Yunus. And so our main focus during this breakdown is going to be whether or not Blanchfield can get Rose to the ground and keep her on the ground for long enough to win this fight. It is a five-rounder, which is great news because obviously it's not a title fight or a main event. So I love it when the UFC does stuff like this. Just for the hell of it, we saw him do it with Shamaya versus Whitaker last week as well. Because it's a great fight. I'm very happy this is, you know, being turned into a five-rounder just for the lulls. Um, so, yeah, both girls have got good cardio. So that shouldn't, you know, influence the fact it's five rounds too much, which was a bit different compared to the Whitaker fight against Shamaya last week because we knew Shamaya would likely slow if it went deep, which it didn't. Um, but with this one, we just get an extra two rounds against two amazing athletes so <clears throat> all right how do we see this one can rose keep it standing so the great thing about what we do is we don't need to speculate or gamble on anything we've got the fight footage to show us exactly what is true so when it comes to rose nami Yunus's take down the fence and whether she's going to be able to keep this fight standing for long enough to use her advantages on the feet we can start off by taking a look at Nami Yunus's takedown defense statistic which is just 59 percent which to be honest isn't good because with Blanchfield being one of the best offensive wrestlers in the division and a better offensive wrestler than many of the fighters that Nami Yunus has faced in her career if Nami Yunus's takedown defense is only 59 percent against fighters who in my opinion and at the level of Blanchfield when it comes to offensive wrestling for me personally just on paper, before we even look at the footage, that doesn't bode well for Nami Yunus' chances of keeping the fight standing. So what we then want to do is take a look at some fight footage to see what is true. So we will kick things off by taking a look at Nami Yunus's fight against Amanda Rebus. Obviously, Tracy Cortez is a grappler, so in theory, that would have been a great fight to gauge where Nami Yunus's takedown defense was at. Unfortunately, Cortez came in on short notice. And I think because she was worried about gassing herself out, she basically didn't shoot barely any takedowns. If we look at the stats for that fight, we can see that in five rounds, she only shot uh, two takedowns, but like didn't really commit to them. Like You can take a quick look at them if you want to. Uh, well, actually, we'll just bring it up quickly. But um, she didn't really fully commit to them. So, <clears throat> not that useful, to be honest with you, in telling us a lot about Nami Yunus's takedown offense. So, if we go to round two, so she didn't shoot any takedowns in round one. If we just skim through round two real quick. You can see here, Cortez grabs a hold of Rose, hits an outside trip. So you can see Rose goes down very easily and gives her back up. She defends the position. All good stuff. And that was pretty much it for that round. If we then look at round... Uh, if we go to round four, by this point, Cortez was very, very tired. And like I say, on the stats, it does show that Cortez attempted takedowns that we're not looking at like one in round three one in round five but she didn't fully commit to them so it doesn't really tell us a whole lot you know 
if if we actually look at the the footage of those takedown attempts. So round four late on. There's the double leg into outside trip, but again Rose goes down pretty easily. Um, pops back up to her feet almost immediately, but again Blanchfield's a far better offensive wrestler than Cortez is. So the the Cortez fight doesn't tell us a whole lot. If we look at the Rebus fight, we get a bit more information. Of course, what is good about the Cortez fight is Cortez's style of wrestling or style of grappling, I should say is closer to Blanche Fields in the sense that she's shooting traditional single leg takedown entries to inside outside trips whereas Rebus's style of getting fights to the ground is more judo trips and throws but still you still get to see what Nami Yunus's balance is like how easy it is to get her down so we can see Cortez did get Rose down relatively easily but she was able to pop back up to her feet quickly and we see something similar in this Rebus fight to be fair so here you can see nice entry from Rebus, hits an outside trip, but Rose keeps the overhook, gets to her knees, immediately pops back up. We just skip through. Then again Rose runs into another judo throw type takedown. And again goes down very easily. Rebus gets her down pretty easily, but Rose immediately hits a reversal in the top position. So all good stuff, but again, one thing that's really standing out to me in this footage is that Rebus and Cortez are able to get Rose down very easily, but they're not able to establish a dominant position. Is that because Rose is very difficult to control on the ground, or because Cortez and Rebus don't have particularly good grappling control, and so they're not as good at maintaining top position as someone like Blanchfield would be? So if we go into the third round, then there's a few you know, half ass takedown attempts here from Rebus that she does a fully, fully commit to. You can see one coming up in a second. You know, she went to shoot one and then Rose kind of, kind of countered her and shot one back. But if we look at the third round, <clears throat> here we go. Any second now. Rebus threatened the takedown attempt. There she gets it into an outside trip. So again, Rebus easily gets a takedown. But Rose has that butterfly hook on the right side, stands back up. And then again, again, Rose gets taken down easily. So what I'm seeing here is when you fully commit to a takedown on Rose, you take her down almost 100% of the time. You know, Rose's takedown defense stat is at 59% because they're obviously counting takedown attempts the fighters didn't fully commit to. But when fighters fully commit to the takedown, even ones that aren't particularly good offensive wrestlers like Tracy Cortez and Amanda Rebus, they're hitting them at quite a high percentage of the time. So then if we look at the Carla Esparza fight, the last time that Rose really fought like a proper wrestler, again, you know, Carla didn't really commit to takedowns. Similar to Tracy Cortez, she didn't really commit to takedowns. So again, it doesn't tell us a whole lot but what we will do is have a look at the one round where Carla actually did fully commit to takedowns, which was round four. <clears throat> and you can kind of see how Rose's takedown offense holds up there. You can see, and this is what I mean by not fully committing, right, at the beginning of round four watch. So Carla shoots a takedown above hip height, but does a drive through a fully commit to it. She gives up on it very easily. So there's no point in going through 25 minutes of footage showing you all the times that Carla does that. We're much better off focusing on the takedown attempts where she actually does fully commit to the takedown. And Carla just got it in her mind in this round that, you know, she really wanted to get a takedown and get some top control. So again, fully commit to this one. Rose gets taken down. Obviously a much more persistent takedown attempt that time from Carla <coughs> but not able to establish a dominant position off it another one here ankle pick and Rose is very scrambly so obviously a recurring theme from what we're seeing is Rose is very easy to get down but difficult to hold down she doesn't uh, accept being in a bad position she explodes out of positions like there scrambles back up to her feet very quickly 
And then the other footage that I want to show you is of the Wei Lei Zhang fight. The second one. Because we do see something a little bit different in this fight from Rose. So if we take a look at the rounds for this fight. Because there was a lot of grappling in this rematch. <clears throat> so you'll see something a little bit different from Rose here. So remember we were saying that. You know, it was very notable that Rebus or Cortez got Rose down easily. Carla not so much. But neither Rebus nor Cortez were able to hold, obviously, Rose down that easily. She was quickly scrambling back up to her feet. Now, is that Rose is very difficult to hold down? Is it, you know, Cortez and Rebus lacking good grappling control? Well, if we look at someone like Wei Lei Zhang, who's far more physically imposing on the ground... More similar to an Erin Blanchfield in terms of physicality. We can see she gets an easy outside trip there. And Rose tries to elevate Zhang with a butterfly hook in the same way that she did Carla. But this time, because Zhang is stronger, more physically imposing, she's not able to use that butterfly hook to scramble back up to her feet. So 2 minutes 40 seconds left to go in the round. Rose just has to go to close guard. And then if we skip through... Even though Rose is very active and scrambly off her back, we can see that she takes a bit longer to pop back up, but eventually does scramble back up. Zhang snaps her back down off the single leg, but again, Rose immediately back up to her feet. So again, we're seeing a trend here where even against the stronger, more physically imposing fighter like Zhang, Rose is struggling to... Uh, Rose is struggling to, to stay standing. She is getting taken down, but she's doing a great job of popping back up. <clears throat> if we then go into round two. This is notable to me because obviously Zhang is a lot more physically imposing, a lot heavier from top position than both Cortez and Rebus. So here we go. Catches a kick, turns it into a takedown. But again, Rose is scrambly off the bottom. And quickly creates enough space for herself off her back to get back up. Good stuff. And gets her own takedown. Into round three. Again, takedown, Rose gives it up quite cheaply, but gets to her knees very quickly and then scrambles into top position pretty much. Well, doesn't actually. Almost got into top position there, but then lost the scramble, ended up mounted. But again, it shows Rose is quite difficult to control. In the round four... Again, Rose gives up a takedown here. <clears throat> Outside trip incoming. Actually, she just sat her down. Pick wins a scramble, ends up on top. So, what this footage is saying to me is... Rose does give up a lot of takedowns, but she's very, very difficult to control. And this is quite notable to me because in the Man and Furo fight, Blanchfield didn't use as much grappling as people thought she would. In fact, she barely shot any takedowns at all. And I think this is because early on, Blanchfield felt Furo's athleticism, physicality, and a couple grappling positions early in the fight. And then felt, you know what, this girl's too big and strong for me to take down and hold down. So I'm not going to burn energy trying to do that. And risk gassing myself out. I'm just going to stand and bang zombie forward. And just you know. Block punches with my face and get outstruck. Not the best game plan. Not the best strategy. But she is young. She is inexperienced. And that's very different from the version of her. We saw against Taylor Santos. Where even though she was struggling to take Santos down. She still came out spam takedowns. For 15 minutes. So with this fight. What version of Blanchfield are we going to get? Are we going to get the wet blanket version of Blanchfield that comes out like shit against Taylor Santos, spams takedowns, stick the rose like glue, 
and just tries to smother her in pressure and relentless grappling. If she fights like that, I think Blanchfield's got a great chance of winning. Or are we going to get the version of Blanchfield that fought Furo, where she may hit a few takedowns on Rose, but may find it difficult to control Rose because we've seen how scrambly Rose is, especially against strong opponents like Wei Lei Zhang. And, you know, once Rose has quickly scrambled back up to her feet two or three times against Blanchfield, which she more than likely will, especially early when they're both fresh, is Blanchfield then going to lose faith in her ability to win the fight with grappling like she did against Furo, give up on it, and then essentially just spend 25 minutes getting her face jabbed off and leg kicked to death by Rose. I do think that's a very real possibility. So how do we put all this together from a betting point of view? And how do we see this fight? Well, for me personally, I think Rose is looking better than ever at flyweight. I think that Rose just is healthier and stronger and more explosive at flyweight. She's looked really good against Cortez and Rebus. She seems very happy, very motivated. Wei Lei Zhang for me is a much more physically imposing fighter than Blanchfield. Blanchfield is still quite slight. She's quite feminine. And so... If Rose is able to beat someone like Zhang in the scramble, you know, if someone like Zhang is struggling to hold Rose down for very long, I think this one could get really dicey for Blanchfield. And the difference between Blanchfield and Zhang is that Zhang is obviously a decent striker. She's got the power to hurt you and get respect on the feet. She's a lot more technical than Blanchfield. Blanchfield's got no power in her hands. She's very bad defensively. So there's nothing she can really do to set up the takedowns or cause Rose a problem on the feet. And so for that reason, this could be a really difficult fight for Blanchfield. If Wei Lei Zhang struggled to hold Rose down for very long and lost so many scrambles against Rose, even though Blanchfield may be a better technical grappler than Zhang, we know the physicality has such a big impact on women's MMA, specifically in grappling positions, to the extent that yeah, I think this could be a tough fight for Blanchfield. Um, my lean is probably still Blanchfield. I just think that wet blanket style she used against Taylor Santos would be very effective against Rose. But if she fights like she did against Man and Fiora, I think she's in a lot of trouble. And you're only as good as your last fight. So that would be a big concern, big red flag for me if I was betting Blanchfield this week based on the footage I've just shown you. But let me know what you think. So in terms of the over-under on this one, very likely the fight goes deep. Both girls tough, both girls, girls well-rounded. The odds reflect that, though, so you can't really bet anything over-related or fight goes to a decision related. The odds are terrible. In terms of the props, um, Blanchfield by decision, Namunas by decision. The odds aren't great on either. Um, you're probably better off not trying to get too cute on the props and just sticking to the money line. So yeah, I hope you found that breakdown useful. I hope that footage i showed you helped you see the fight for what it is um and see why this could be a tough one for blanchfield i wouldn't i don't like the idea of betting against blanchfield this weekend but i also don't like the idea of betting on her against a fighter who's tough to hold down and very scrambly when we've seen blanchfield kind of give up on her grappling very easily in her last fight against fioro so yeah i hope you found that breakdown useful if you did please hit the like button Please subscribe if you haven't already. Please help me give my new dog a name. When I'm on my way tomorrow, I'll be reading the comments. See what recommendations you guys are giving me. Check out my website, MMABettingTips.com. If you watch every UFC event, you may as well join us in the live betting group. You will make money if you do so. So have a great week. I'll be back on Thursday with another breakdown video. 100 likes. We'll do another video on Friday. Take care, everyone. Love you all. Thank you very much for watching. See you all very soon. Nice one, guys. Bye.